So we would like to introduce the host of the next session, uh, Lynn Murphy, who is a dear friend uh, of many years. Uh, and she's an incredible human being, an activist. She's a researcher of education. She's been consulting uh, nonprofit organizations around the world, um, has worked for many years in Africa, and um, she's passionate about decolonizing practices mm -hmm. and, and just helping us be and create more, more I want to say Lin. something. Okay. Lin, Lin. Lin, Lin is Lin. <laughs> Lin is my, my sister from another family in another continent. We met about 20 years ago, exactly 21 years ago at Burning Man. And we have been at Burning Man for 10 years in the same camp. We have been, she's, we have been growing together. I was already fairly grown up at the time. But, and so she has always been really... A figure in my life and in our life and just a sister a daughter and um, it's an honor to share her her with this community so and lynn will uh, introduce pat mccabe and um, create a space for pat to share her wisdom with us lynn thank you thank you Maurizio and zaya Thank you for the love and the trust and the lived solidarity over many years. Yeah. Thank you for sharing sand with me and with so many of us, having the courage to create. Yeah. And I have the honor to introduce um, Pat McCabe. Woman stands shining. As we saw this morning, Pat is of the Diné nation and she was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. Many of us know her as an international speaker. We've heard many of her, many of us have heard her with her medicine talks. She's a global ceremonial prayer and a deep listener for spiritual guidance and original instructions. Part of the, the words that I received to share Pat with us today and what I've experienced with her is a deep commitment to propose a paradigm alternative to our modern world paradigm. And um, she has a deep inquiry into the exploration of the masculine and feminine principles in economics, in right relations, in many ways. And she's currently following guidance about retelling critical parts of humanity's collective story something we heard the importance from bio just now um, as a, as a means of changing our collective trajectory into the future. I've had the honor of really getting to know Pat over the past year as she and I are both part of something called the defend the sacred. And it is an emerging global alliance um, of peoples and communities um, around the world dedicated to what might be called sacred activism as we unite in prayer and mutual support and really culture to culture he healing and shared action. So with my heart full of gratitude for this, this woman with a tremulousness of receiving the transmission from bio and often the, the beautiful medicine space that Pat has offered, I welcome her fully into this space. Welcome, Pat. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I, get to, I get to be in control of my mute and unmute. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm. Pat, I want to just perhaps um, just maybe start us with where you brought us in the opening ceremony. And you brought us to a place of invoking that we have passed through many worlds, worlds that have already been lost, that have come before, that worlds that rise and fall, and this rhythm. And you invoked that it is not a failing to come to the end of our resources, that it is not a failing for us to feel at the end, and that ceremony can hold it all. And I just want to open this space for you to go deeper into those teachings and perhaps say what's on your heart about what this moment is initiating us into and what is our task. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, um, my new friends at Sand, uh, new friends and old friends, uh, part of this community. Really honored to be here today. And I uh, just wanted to introduce myself um, in a formal way. Uh, to you, but also to, to that which is beyond us that is also um, watching and listening for us and these inquiries that we're in. So I'll just say, uh, And um, I, I get, uh, I'm, I'm telling you about the, my, my mother's clans my father's mother's clan. Um, and so we get our clans from our mothers, and uh, and and so that those those clan names are referring to places on the earth, and they're referring to our relationship to those places, and the ways in which those places furthered our humanity. Um, sometimes through worlds, <laughs> more than just this one that we know right now. Um, and so, so this is an acknowledgement of that, of that long line that I was talking about before. And then at a certain point in my, in my journey, I was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. And I was given that name, Wiyakpa, Wiyakpa Najiwi. Um, and so I, I always uh, am so delighted to acknowledge this uh, beautiful, medicine way that that came and took hold of me and <laughs> has been guiding me um, on my way for some time now and um, has has taught me a lot more um, about being what it means what it could mean to be human and who we are where we are how it is <laughs> from another perspective you know um, and so you know I I'm I'm thinking I, I I had this beautiful invitation from Victoria when we were having a meeting <laughs> about this, about our opening. And she just said to me, um, you know, just own it, <laughs> own it. And um, when she said that, uh, it was like some veils in my heart parted. And I felt like she was saying, no, no, we, we would really welcome and invite that place that's way, way deep inside there. And what came to me immediately was, was my kind grandfather talking about this, this idea of the, of the traveling through the worlds. And um, he talked about, uh, he talked about how we had lost one world to the flood. Many, many traditions acknowledge that place in our history. And, uh, and he, he said that we even knew why we had lost that world. <laughs> we had lost that world uh, because men and women uh, believed that they could live without each other. So we were working on that issue even then. <laughs> it's been a long, it's been a, it's been a long running issue of, of misunderstanding and, and difficulty for us. Um, and so, uh, and then, and then he also talked about how and this is during my lifetime. And I have that sense of that, of, of this too, but I don't really know. I wish he, he, he traveled on, so I don't get to ask him these questions, but I, I, I wonder what that definition would be for him, you know, but he said that we, we have moved from the glittering world to the green world right now. And I feel that transition in my own, my own life, uh, my own, uh, my own heart, um, 
even when I listen to the music from another time, <laughs> from my younger years, and I know this is true of every generation, but I have a sense that it's that it's even deeper than 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 just different ways. You know, my mom's 96, and I'm here in her house, and uh, you know, every every Saturday we're we're tuned in to Lawrence Welk, you know, and um, and so you know, there's always a difference in music <laughs> between the generations. But I have a sense of even how the music is held in this electronic way that there's there's some additives going on there that are really um, uh, changing, uh, trying to change our our nature subliminally and um, and with and with technology, trying to merge this technology into our biology in in ways. So um, I won't get too much into that, but I just have the sense that yeah, that I have changed from one world to another world now and um and then i i so so i so i keep seeing us you know part of my um part of my method for for um dealing with my own trauma because i come from a people uh uh which survived um attempted genocide <laughs> flat out attempted genocide of, of my whole race and people here and um, so I always, lately, I've been feeling the need to say, you know, I, I want to, I want to say that out loud, um, because, because it takes a lot to, to sit here, in ease and grace, sometimes. And, and I, um, I have the mannerisms and the education and the, the academic education and the. I understand the, the ways and the protocols of modern world paradigm. And so that's part of the reason why, why people want me to come and speak. But I want to say that there are many, many, many who stand behind me who don't have that upbringing. And I'm glad that they don't. I'm glad that they're living in another way on this earth that that struggles to meet a gathering like this <laughs> because it's so profoundly different <laughs> such a different way of being human and understanding how to be human so i want to acknowledge that this crossroads that bio brought up right there's this crossroads right here with me being here i would i would so much prefer in, in many ways to have my my elders be here, but you know they're not going to sit in front of a Zoom camera <laughs> and try to to address and take in all of this. And so they're holding a place that is essential. It's essential for me, but I feel like it's essential for the whole. And so that's what's standing behind me. So I want to acknowledge that I'm the least of my people. I'm the least of my people. And and spirit has has asked me to be to be this for us. And so I'm, I'm so grateful to hold this place. Um, you know, I, I'll just say a, a little bit about this history because I, I think it's important for you to know who's, who is talking to you here. And who's talking to you is, um, I am the story of US history and the story of that attempt to genocide. You know, my, my grandparents, well, in the mid 1800s, we were my people were taken captive into a concentration camp in the southern part of New Mexico, and uh, many of my people perished. We just had an anniversary of the first group that was marched, you know, that over 400 miles down to that, to that we called it Hueldi, the place of suffering. And so we were taken into that place, and we um, we weren't allowed to leave until we signed a treaty, and that treaty said that we um, had to turn our children over to the schools of <clears throat> of this uh, of this other way you know so the united states government and the church kind of collaborated to create these, these these schools that maybe are coming into more 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 awareness into collective consciousness about the residential boarding schools and and they were said to um to their purpose was to make our own culture so repulsive to us that we would never go back to it. That was the goal. 
And so my grandparents were taken into uh, Dutch Christian Reformed missionary boarding schools, residential boarding schools, and then later they sent their children there during the Great Depression, um, when our way of life had been deeply dismantled and, and we were trying to be brought into this American way of life and then that collapsed as well. Um, so it actually ended up being a place of refuge during my parents' generation. You know, nothing is ever black and white. <laughs> and um, and so uh, my parents were, were raised there. So all this is to say that by the time I came along, um, no one was speaking the language to me and no one was practicing our ways. And, um, and, and so I didn't have any of that cultural heritage. You know, I think sometimes people uh, will look at an indigenous person that looks like me and think, wow, you know, we just have it all ready made for us to just step into and carry on these beautiful, all the beauty of the traditions that people are familiar with, all the sayings. But, but no, we don't, we don't have that easy out either. <laughs> any more than any human being right now has. <laughs> like, uh, like we, have to, we have to fight for it. We have to seek it out. We have to want it. We have to move through our trauma, as, as Bio was talking about. We have to, um, I've had to. And so um, I feel like it's important for you to understand that, that I'm also in that journey of, of homecoming and wayfinding. And, um, you know, I, I didn't fit with my own people and I didn't fit in modern world. You know, here I am looking like this, but I have no knowledge of what this is. And everybody wants to know what is all this about, you know? And I have nothing to say about that. And then I go to my own people and they say, man, you can't even speak our language and you don't know this, you know. So I've been, I was in this no man's land. And I, and I, I bring this up uh, because what I want to say is um, I felt uh, like not only did I not have a place, but I felt useless, profoundly useless in my existence here. <laughs> But I was brought into ceremony, my very first ceremonies in the Lakota way. And something about that made me be able to send out a call to creator and say, if I can be of service, even, even as this, even as this being that, that right now at that time, you know, f feels so lacking in every way, I was sent to East Coast boarding schools. Uh, my father went to Stanford and we were part of very high academics. My brother went to Stanford, my daughter, my niece and nephew all went to Stanford. So I was on that track for success, fame and fortune, hopefully, right? And, uh, but I couldn't do it. So I couldn't do that and I couldn't be this. And, and I really felt um, like I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And so I put this call out to creator and I said, you know, even, even as this, I would be willing to be of service. And um, man, that's all I had to say. <laughs> that's all I had to say. And Spirit was like, all right, I got a job for you, girl. And um, boy, it's been off to the races ever since then. So so I, I, I hold this, this seat of the indigenous seat, so to speak, with a great deal of humility and a great deal of gratitude and a great, a huge amount of, like I was talking about, of meeting that mystery. Who I am and my place in this tapestry has been able to be of service in thousands of ways that I never could have conceived of, including sitting here today with you. So, um, so my life has very much been a part about opening up to that mystery, opening up to that greater intelligence. Uh, you know, in, in the academic way, uh, and maybe we could even say in the scientific way, um, much of the time we believe that we are here to generate. We're gonna generate reality. We're gonna generate, we're gonna create it. But, <clears throat> but what I have found in this journey, going back home, so that's what I say, my greatest gift to the world is, is describing my journey going back into 
a way of being human here that that understands that I am part of a of a tapestry of of life that's running, and that I've been given, I've been equipped to be a member of that in some way, and I'm having to to discover it. Sometimes I have guides and elder, human elders and guides and teachers. Most of the time I don't. Most of the time I have to go directly to the earth herself. I have to go to the water, even my little glass of water right here. I'm consulting this morning and saying, you know, please, please be the one to speak to us here because you've seen it all. You've watched the worlds come and go and we still have this water the same water that was there at the very beginning. It's the same water that my ancestors drank. I say it's even the same water that Tyrannosaurus Rex drank. Because <laughs> it's just been it's just been circulating. It's been keeping this record and it's also been informing us. It's been informing us of of the possibility for life. And so I I say that you know my greatest gift to humanity is is to describe my journey going back home to this place of understanding and i guess i'll i'll um i'll say that uh it's not a perfect place <laughs> there are potholes there for sure um you know it's not a per maybe it was never a perfect place that's why my clan clan grandfather used to say here we are holy earth surface walkers dazzled by creation coming upon temptation and, and he was talking about long before colonization. We were still just human beings coming upon this temptation <laughs> business. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, and my, and my daughter, maybe some of you know Lila June Johnston, she says, you know, the reason that we have part of our knowledge is because we've already been through a lot of trial and error <laughs> that we have, that, that we had to learn through but that we held on to the, those stories, that history. That's why our storytelling is so powerful and important to us to be able to keep, keep that knowledge um, intact and moving forward through us. And, and so we, we, um, we, have, we have that humanity the same as anybody else. And, then, and now we have this layer of trauma on top of all of that. And that, that project to disrupt everything that we held um, had varying degrees of success. But um, initially, my, my willingness to address this trauma, because I realized it wasn't just Diné people's trauma, and it wasn't just our neighboring Hopi and, and Ute and uh, you know, all these neighboring tribes' trauma. It wasn't just U.S. trauma. Eventually, this road has taught me that that the whole global human family has been through many generations now of trauma. Whether we have been uh, the perpetrators of the trauma or the receivers of the trauma, to be an interbeing and to commit trauma and to receive trauma is, is, is traumatizing. And so, so, our work is is collective that way and and so initially for me my what i said and what i've said to to my children is i said you know i have to overcome this trauma <laughs> i have to find a way to dissipate this trauma out from me because if i don't then i will complete the genocide myself and i refuse <laughs> I refuse to do that. I will not do that. And so I am bound to find the way out of that. But then when I realize that it's not just me and it's not just us, it's them, whoever them is, it's them too. <laughs> and so we, we, I feel are on a, a road and a, and a mission, if you will, to, to not allow ourselves to be the ones to complete the ecocide. 
to complete the degradation of our honor as human being collectively. And so now the river of this journey is taking another turn to see how we as global family, what do we have? What do we have in our, in our little tool, toolbox? What do we have in our, in our little bag of medicine to remember who we are and how we're all related? To, you know, I asked Spirit before, before um, coming here this morning, what is the main thing you want me to say? And, and it's, uh, uh, it, it was that to speak of our impeccable honor that is so inherent in our construction, in the construction of our bodies, the very material that our body is made up of, the construction of, of these tears the construction of our heart, our feeling, our feeling is so powerful, a medicine to creation here on earth, here with all of our relations that I spoke of earlier, the flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, mountains, stone people, sky, but, but even beyond, but even beyond held within us in our very way of being constructed is a is an ancient plan we are destined i'm going to say we have a lot of choosing to do to to achieve this destiny it's not a given but we are destined to not only overcome all the many ways in which we have been made to believe in separations of every kind, but we are destined to restore with this mother earth a way of being that, that allows this mother earth also to fulfill her destiny. We are so bound together. And she can do part of that without us, but for her, for us to be with her in her destiny moves things in our solar system, in our galaxy, in the way our galaxy moves among galaxies, in worlds that are not embodied. This, this meeting of the beauty of, of the heart of the, of the multiverse, this mother earth, the heart of it all, and our heart, the way our heart is connected to her, stands to liberate much more than we can see Every time we overcome, it's not just us that we're freeing. It's beings, energies, entities, primal building blocks of futures that are also liberated with us. And so they wanted me to really try my best to convey to you that maybe you have never been told what you are, how precious you are. And time is not what you think it is. You know, my, my, I've been really, I come from women who live to be over a hundred. So I've been really saying, I'm going to, I'm going to hold it down and I'm going to do my best for a hundred years. And then when they proposed to me that 
humanity's presence here has been hundreds of thousands of years. I thought, wow, I'm not even a drop in the in the time bucket. What difference does it make? And they said, no, no, you mustn't think that way. It makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. So, so we have to remember that time is not linear. <laughs> and they proposed to me that they say to me, if all times are happening at the same time, what is possible? <laughs> and I love that proposition because it seems like many, many, many things are possible. So here I stand, holy earth surface walker. So let's really take that, take that name for us in. Here we are, holy earth surface walkers. A conduit between the heart of the Mother Earth and this holy star, our sun. Our feeling, our song, our tears, our ability to embrace being interbeing here with this Mother Earth is about relationship. And the very highest point of relationship is, is love. So it's, it's our, our ability to keep invoking and bringing that love forward. And sometimes we have to do that by going through our rage, by going through some very deep retelling with it now that we can have an understanding of what we really are we can go back to that traumatized being that thought that it was just there to create money <laughs> for somebody somewhere we can stand in a higher place of understanding of who we are just like you would go back to your little kid and tell them the way that you made sense of your story, it served to help you survive. But now I want to give you some more insights into those people around you that couldn't do any better than they did. Let me tell you about what their difficulties were and maybe that will help you understand why they did what they did. Let me, let me tell you um, who you really are and who you, had to, who you were and that, that you had nothing to do with them. So in that same way, we can do that for ourselves. And in so in many ways, I feel like this is what indigenous culture has to offer beyond songs and dances. That's all part of it, but really is a very tenacious understanding of our deep, deep honor, our deep, deep sacredness, a sacredness to each other, but a sacredness to the water, to the mountain, even to this star above us that sends news, that sends news of us, that sends news of our ways of loving and cherishing our interbeing out beyond anything we know out to the other galaxies and places in the multiverse. And they receive that news and it matters. And then they send their news back to this holy star and shines back down to us. And we eat it. We eat it in, in our salads. <laughs> we eat it in our hopefully humble and consensual and honoring ways of eating a fish or a deer or a buffalo. And so we have this very, very great conversation going on all the time. So imagine us that way, that we are, we are a part of that. And our clarity, our, our heart, 
the whole creation depends upon this heart, this human heart that that creator put in you. There have been times when I've cursed my own heart and creator said, I gave you that heart. <laughs> I gave that heart to you. And so I, I say, okay, I, I will live into this heart that you gave to me. And it's, it's a medicine unlike any other. So, so as, as our brother is, is saying, you know, uh, this trauma, we are moving, we have an opportunity here. Let's not waste this crisis. We have an opportunity here to resolve, to open ourselves. Because even if a vaccine will solve this problem, I got a feeling we won't get out of it that easy. There'll be another one. <laughs> we are being called <laughs> to, to come to terms with the truth of ourselves, the purity of ourselves, the innocence of our love that we haven't had access to for a long time, maybe, and eventually come to be that one that that sends that sends out the song of understanding of the beauty of who we are where we are how it is as human being well, I'm going to see if Lynn has anything to say right here <laughs> <laughs> I really want to thank you for in this moment kind of how, what were your words kind of falling against the door of mystery and allowing what came through to come through um, in embodying and offering the teachings of how we uphold the honor to be humans in this moment. And what comes to me to ask is I have heard you speak about how we continue, let me say this, this moment of however we're defining this crisis for many um, it, we've been seeing how we're cutting through the illusion of separation and coming back into perhaps from our peripheral vision, but starting to see more of the possibility of interconnectedness. And when I've heard you speak about um, the power over paradigm and actually moving into a thriving life paradigm, some part of me it feels to ask you about where the, the work is that you've done on understanding the feminine and the masculine in coming back into this thriving life paradigm of how we uphold our honor of being human, being walking on the earth right now. And you can enter it through that doorway. I've also heard you enter it through the doorway of speaking about sovereignty, sovereignty and consent of how we work with all our relations. So, <clears throat> um, <laughs> so this honorable being you know, one of my elders, maybe some of you have heard me say this, you were born into beauty as beauty for joyful life. That's the truth. You were born into beauty as beauty for joyful life. That's the truth. Joyful, or maybe we can say harmonious. Um, 
or we can say balanced. I don't want to give the impression that that there's uh, not times of having to dig really deep <laughs> in that in that we say that word hojo, uh, which some people translate as beauty, but it's beauty, it's harmony, it's vitality, it's uh, it's all all of that way of being being a part of the thriving life. Um, so so we. Um, A big exploration of mine was, you know, when in the Lakota way, when I was presented with this sacred hoop of life concept in which every every member of life gets to have a seat. I was given the honor of having a seat here on this Mother Earth, including us. You know, we're not the whole hoop, but we get to have our place on the hoop. And every every member is given a way to contribute to the whole such that life thrives not just our biological life, but our, but our, our emotional life, our intellectual life, our spiritual life. Really, it really has to take in that whole concept of, of what makes us have vitality, you know? So when we say sustainability, we're very often looking at the mechanical, biological world, it seems to me, but our sustainability actually comes from you know, we say that our health or originates in our spirit and in our feelings. So when we have disease, we don't start with, like by the time it comes to the physical, you've already been, you've already been, um, it's already been moving in you for a long time in your spiritual, in your emotional, in your mental, and then eventually it gets to the physical. So for us in modern world to talk about sustainability, we're, 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 we're addressing it way out here. We're not addressing it down at the root. And so this, so to, to be a member of this hoop means that you have a, a, a way of contributing to this thriving, being what you are, being made what you are. And so human beings have this. I have to assume that if we were placed here, that we must also have this perfect design for thriving life, as I say. So my question has been, all right, um, uh, one, do we know what this design is? And I'm going to say that that by and large, it feels like humanity has forgotten what what is what is this design? What aspects of ourselves are part of that design for thriving life? Because we forgot about life somewhere along the way. We we took it for granted, or we were distracted or whatever, but we have not been putting life at the center of every decision we make for some time. And so we, um, so that's been my question. Do I know what my de design is for thriving life? And part of my question then became, what does it mean to be the female of our kind holding this seat on this sacred hoop? What does it mean to be the female of our kind? And, and so for me, I had, you know, and I do call it a privilege. I had the privilege of going into another paradigm, another version of humanity that lives in the exact same place, under the same sky, under the same mountains, with the same water, with the same earth, um, but does it in a completely different way. And that's a real privilege. It's taken me a long time to understand that that's not what everybody has. But I can go into this place of indigenous paradigm and I can look at, well, how do, how do we hold our gender? How do we hold the female? And what does that mean? Why is that, why is that so different from modern world paradigms view of this? And so I began to work with that in my own ceremony and I began to, to see that my biology gives me a spiritual capacity. <laughs> My biology gives me a way to contribute to that sacred hoop in a way that only I can. And so my whole, um, my whole understanding of being an empowered female changed <laughs> pretty radically. I mean, this was 20 years process, but I, I didn't, I didn't need to, I didn't need to replicate what the men were trying to do. There was places that only I could hold. And I say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a dreamer for the people. I'm biologically made 
to be a dreamer and a visioner for the people. And that, and that happened for me in awareness for seven years while I still had my menstruation. And so to realize that, that, I, that I held this, you know, I, I began to not be as interested in what was going on over the fence over there with the men. Um, not that I didn't care about them, but I just didn't, there was a function that I needed to fulfill for us. And that, that um, ability to bring dream and to bring, um, well, direct instruction from the Mother Earth about how to be here, that that, that that was very crucial for us. So I've been having to hold this knowledge, and I know I'm not the only one holding it from, from, uh, for women of all cultures. There are many women who are deeply involved with this, but, but what I had to then face was how to bring that out into a paradigm that didn't understand what I was offering that, that held um, women in, in such a way where that voice is not easy to make a space to be heard. And so through that process, you know, I began to realize that, um, that if I hold such a, such a specialized role, I guess we could say, as being the female of our kind, as a menstruator, then what, what do the men hold? And I, and I do see the men as the counterpart to, to me. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, I'm only speaking about binary um, relationships or sexuality or, or such, but, but, I, but I have to recognize that as I look around this earth, you know, it is, it is the male and female counterparts that further this life. And so I began to be really curious about how, you know, what is, what is the men's role in this and um, in, their, in the way that they contribute to thriving life. So for me, you know, I went right to my biology as I was exploring what is, what is the, the, the feminine medicine that I carry because we haven't been going down the wrong road so long that we've de our biology has devolved to support a death way. Our biology is still doing everything it can to support a life way. So my biology has a lot of clues for me about, about what this design is. So as I began to look at Men's Nation, um, you know, I, I, I realized that, you know, the masculine Eros is, is a very powerful force among us. And right now it's being really, really scrutinized deeply and not in a kind way. And I, it's taken um, many experiences in ceremony and, many, and, and, and at one point a very deep year that I wasn't sure I was gonna survive of envisioning uh, or, 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 or really being able to see and feel what took place during the witch hunts in Europe. And it was so extreme, like I say, I didn't know if I was gonna live through that. But, but to come out the other side of that and to, and to recognize how deeply violated the sacred masculine was in, that, in those circumstances. And to be able to, to see um, the beauty of the men, what they bring to, to this situation and how they have been manipulated. It hasn't only been the women that have been manipulated, the men have been manipulated so deeply as well. And so I, I came to this place of deep compassion that um, I never expected to find for the for men's nation. And and so today, you know, I I support them. I mean, those words sound maybe a little too simple, but the depth of my support for them has has changed everything in my life. Um, to, to, to say that, you know, you are sacred beings and you, your Eros is sacred and holy. Your Eros serves the thriving life way. And I want to propose that there is a way to 
have that aspect of you be celebrated, upheld, um, nurtured and nourished by the entire community. I don't know what that way is yet, <laughs> but I know it has to be because that is such a deeply inherent part of the medicine that you bring. So I call you sacred fire keeper. You're tending a very sacred fire. It's the fire that assures that life will continue. And now we're coming to a time when a lot of life is being taken. Even before coronavirus, many, many human lives were being taken, but also many of our other relatives' lives were being taken. And so now we come to that place where we have to consider what is it that drives our life forward? That's part of what's in our medicine bag. That's part of what's in our tools. And we're gonna need to recognize that in some new way to, you know, as, as the spirits have said to me, you're being called on to birth yourselves anew. And so, you know, re-envision yourself, you know, outside of this wound that's at the core of your procreative ability. So because we haven't, I'm going to say we, we haven't really understood how to enact that design for so long. I think it only makes sense for us to call out to all the elders around us. Again, the flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, mountains, standing nation, the stone people. They, have, they were here long before we arrived. They know how this place is. And they have an ability to impart that understanding to us. So I guess I can say just, you know, people always say, well, how? How do we do this? So, so one, um, address the water. Address the water that you're going to drink and acknowledge all of the wisdom that is there, this water that has seen us through every transition, world to world to world. And so this water has seen us through this, through it all. And so this water, I say, has incorruptible faith. And so we can call upon this water for knowledge. Teach me, tell me, show me. Let me connect with these ancestors who have passed through these times and who have created themselves and recognized themselves in an all new way in order to be able to, to pass through and come to another world. Address, address the fire. You know, I have my little fire, I don't know if you can see it. I have my little fire going here. Because that fire is the same way, you know, that fire um, is what saw all, every one of our ancestors through to this moment. Now we can just go over and flick the switch on the wall We'll see how much longer we're gonna to get to do that. Um, and we're gonna to have to remember that fire. We're gonna to have to really appreciate um, how our ancestors knew how to make fire, how they knew how to tend it, care for it, bring it forward. So talk to this fire. My elders say that this, there's, there's no greater teacher, there's no greater school than that sacred fire. No university will ever touch what this fireplace knows. And I'm going to say the same is true for the water. So to, to bring that fire to us and to just inquire and, and say in humility, you know, I'm seeking understanding of myself. Um, you know, basically the prayer is, uh, help me to set aside everything I think I know about what it means to be a human being that I can be open to a new experience. And then the other thing that, that I often tell people um, to begin this conversation is to go out in the morning at sunrise and as that beautiful star is coming up above the horizon uh, to present yourself 
and to say that you're seeking that which serves life, light, and love, and to make an offering, you know. And so in the Kota way, we offer tobacco. In Diné way, in the morning, we offer white cornmeal, and in the evening, yellow cornmeal. But that's a gesture that is recognized all around this earth from humanity of connecting. And so to go out and say, I am seeking to understand who am I? Where am I? How is it really? Show me the truth from the lens of thriving life way. Um, then if you do that every day, for th even for 30 days, begin to see how things come and talk to you in a new way. From a place that doesn't come out of the human mind, it's not a good idea. <laughs> I've had to abandon my good ideas and my good idea maker by and large. Once the map has been laid out for me by this whole interbeing, I mean, why would I think I would know everything about how to be in harmony with the whole interbeing? I need the whole interbeing to help inform me to understand what is right mind, right heart, right body, right action. And so to to receive that structure, then I get to put this one to use. But I have to know how it, how it fits, you know, and, and I guess I'll just say a, a few words about this consent and this sovereignty. You know, what I realize is that my elders consider every being a sovereign being. So if I'm going to go and uh, collect some, some sage, which I have done to help me, my, me and my mom have had some some lung difficulties. My clan grandfather says, you go and you bring a piece of turquoise. I got all my turquoise sitting here on my computer. Uh, go and bring your piece of turquoise out and go talk to those sagebrush and tell them, greet them, acknowledge them, acknowledge how they have been helping us as our elders for so long. And then, you know, like state your case. What are you there for? Why do you need their help? What are you hoping to achieve with their help? And then lay that tobacco down and pray for them. Tell them you're praying. I'm praying for the continuation of, of all of your people, of all this nation. You know, here in New Mexico, we have like our own, our ocean is like this ocean of sagebrush, right? And uh, so talk to them and tell them about it and then ask permission, you know? So that's how we go to harvest this, this plant that can help me survive my lung issue right now. Um, and... And so that's how we talk to these beings because they're sovereign beings. And, and, and so I say that if we are in a free will construct, which I believe that we are, I mean, gosh, look at us. We get to do whatever the heck we can dream up to do. We're just going at it here. Um, and yet the caveat is, can we do everything that we can dream up to do and still have life on this planet? And we're not sure. <laughs> we're not sure we want to give up everything we can dream up to do. That's tough for us. We're like little kids that, that never had any boundaries put on them. And you know, those little kids aren't that fun to be around, poor things. It's not even their fault. But that's kind of how, we, how we've been acting. And so, um, you know, in a free will construct, then uh, we have to acknowledge that it's not just my free will that matters here. It's that water's free will that matters here too. It's that sagebrush's free will that matters here too. It's that tree's <laughs> free will that matters here too. So I don't have the right to interfere with any one of these members on this sacred hoop of life. I don't have the right to interfere in their thriving life design. I don't have the right to interfere with their ability to make the whole thrive. So, you know, maybe because we've been kind of like running wild, that sounds like a, a big limitation. But there is such a, a tension, right? There's a tension in, a, in attending to, to that part also. And the creativity that comes out of, of having certain boundaries, like the banks of a river, right? And so, In a free will construct, consent is imperative. 
And that's why we have to have the consent of that sagebrush. That's why we make a prayer before we go and hunt and take a life. And that's why there's ceremony that's done once that animal's life has been taken. Because we don't get to be here without taking a life. So what a setup, huh? <laughs> the setup is you're going to take a life. I'm going to eat a carrot at least, you know. Uh, and that carrot was on its way to doing something before I got involved. So it's a setup for consent. It's a setup for honoring. It's a setup for it's a setup for relationship. Honorable relationship here in this place. And you know, as I'll stop here. Um, but what I've been saying to Men's Nation because I think they really. Uh, have a difficulty right now and this power over paradigm in which might makes right and which is inherently violent and we feel that violence we're witnessing that violence playing out in every way um men are going to dominate in that place because they are physically stronger and they have been and now it can look kind of all genteel and and dignified and sophisticated but that violence is right right there it's waiting to come out if anything, if anybody tries to upset that hierarchy. We see that, we're witnessing that. And so, you know, what I say to the men is, uh, you, you're, you have a difficult task because I feel like the invitation for you is to give up that seat of power as best you can, willingly come out of there. How do we do that? What inspires us to do such a thing? Well, first of all, it's false power. <laughs> it's an illusion. It's not actually power because it's not leading to life. It's not contributing to the thriving of interbeing. And it's going to have to fall. But the other part of that is to say that, you know, part of the way to operate in that false power is to keep checking in and asking, do I have consent from everything I'm affecting? That's a big question because we have not been asking consent from anything. But if we begin to ask that question, do I have consent of the women? Do I have consent from the earth? Do I have consent from the water? to do what I am proposing. Then we begin to get a feeling for the kinds of shifts that, that are being called for. And we're not probably gonna be able to do it all at once, but to begin to put that into our consciousness maybe is this radical newness that our brother Bio was talking about. <laughs> it's part of it. To remember, again, who we are, where we are, how it is, to remember who we are and how we are all related. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, for offering yourself and what has been gifted to you so generously. Mm -hmm. And before we move into opening up to questions among others, from others here, I just want us to take a moment and just take a breath. Just see what's really moving in you. From that place that woman stand shining spoke to of the honor of being a human surface walking on this holy earth. What's the question that is beating in your heart? And here I look to my cosmic siblings, Maurizio and Zaya. <laughs> That's Victoria to say, what is a, a good way to, 
to receive the questions that are here. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Pat, for this sacred remembrance you shared with us. Um, without too many technicalities, um, there is a little button that um, says raise your hand on your participants list down At the right hand bottom. corner. <laughs> So you can press that button to give us a sign you want to speak, and then we can uh, call your name and unmute you, and just speak of anything that became alive in your heart, or if you have any, any remembrance that happened, or a question that you would like to share. Uh, Boas, I will unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself. Boaz, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we are. Hi, Boaz. Yes, yeah, so, well. Hmm. Well, first of all, thank you. I've. It's been a while since I've encountered such a visceral experience by just listening to someone, um, especially online. It's very. It stands out quite significantly, and I resonate deeply. Um, it's funny how many questions the mind has, but the one that came, regardless of the mind, was maybe you can elaborate about the tension or the paradox between some of how I hear what you're saying, which invites deep reverence, to walk the earth or walk relationships versus this challenge, this struggle, this need to fight, which the way it lands for me, even from an activist point of view, is always about trying to change something with effort, which is almost the opposite from just walking around in this very gentle reverence and surrender almost. So at least for me, they seem paradoxical or at least when they're embodied or they're enacted and animated, they, they seem like they contradict or our intention and maybe you can elaborate on that. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I was saying, and whenever I was invited to speak to activists, whatever that might mean at this point, <laughs> um, I was saying that uh, we actually do have to simultaneously prepare for peace and war even though our brilliant friend said that, that, that you cannot do that. Um, but, we, but, we, but we must, I think. So I feel like, you know, um, recognizing that something was not moving in a thriving life way to, that eventually became very alarming to many of us witnessing, human beings witnessing. Of course, we, we, we felt the need to try to stand. And I feel like that is part of the honor of being a human being, to stand for life, to stand for, you know, I say that as, as the holy earth surface walker, life bringer, life bearer, I stand with the authority of the mother earth. And it is my place always, always to speak on behalf of life and to ask if we are putting life at the center in every circumstance, right? So, um, and if you've ever met any of my grandmas, you know that gets real fierce. You know, it's not, it's not all, it's not all um, gentleness. Uh, but um, so, so there is that place that we felt that we've had to like push up against and say, you know, I, 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 I will not give my consent here. I cannot give my consent here. Everything in my body is telling me I must not give my consent here. Which, by the way, is very important because when we consciously choose what we give our consent to and the power over paradigm has put our consent to sleep by and large we don't even think about consent it's just been running over us and we accept it but but it, even even if we don't know how it can change for us to declare our consent or our non-consent engages spiritual law that also engages spiritual consequences <laughs> So it is very important to declare what you give your consent to and what you do not give your consent to. And that's a spiritual activism place right there. But so we've, been, so we've been having to push up against what we do not want to give our consent to. 
And then at the same time, you know, I personally have been waiting for, I didn't know what form it was going to come, but I've been waiting for the thing that finally bowls us over and kind of wakes us up and puts us in our place. Like this mother earth is not going to put up with this. And so now here comes this particular thing, you know, uh, ecological collapse on a global scale wasn't enough to do it, but this virus is, this virus has got our attention, at least for the moment. Um, and so, so I felt like things were going to come that were going to make it clear how much we've forgotten about life and that there would be a great willingness that would sweep the land. And I do feel like that is what's happening in many places. There is a new willingness that we didn't have before this COVID-19 came to examine certain things, economics shutting down, um, giving money away to people, not so much in the United States, but in other places, um, you know, all these things that were out of the question before, right? So a willingness comes to sweep the land. So as an activist, I feel like we have to do that move where on the one hand, we're pushing, pushing, and then when that willingness comes, come to hold, receive, and embrace. It's a very powerful spiritual move that we're being called on to do. Rather than sit there and say, I told you so, and if you just listen to me and look at the, you know, like if we keep that up, we're gonna miss this powerful moment. So for those of us who have that spiritual ability to be able to move from warrior stance to allowing, welcoming, bringing in that willingness and recognition. I feel like that's what we're called on to do right now. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, Paul, Paul from Buff Buffalo. New York, Paul, Buffalo, Buffalo, New York. Always like hearing from the Buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, can you, you're unmuted. Yes. Okay, yes, the buffalo is our tribal animal here in Western New York. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, the, um, well, I, it's more of a comment, Pat, on um, how I love the fact that you're talking about cycles and all of, and the circles and of unity of all, and it, it brought back very fond memories for me uh, of being hosted on the Navajo Nation for a year um, back in the early 90s. And I, I lived among the uh, Diné, and um, it was a time of letting go a lot for me. And it was also the time of the Junta virus. Um, and, and I'm thinking, wow, here we are again now at a time of, um, of introspection and of letting go. And where does this take us? And, and that was a bridge to a new phase of my life, you know, once I came back um, from the Navajo Nation. Um, and I wanted to comment on, on um, when you talked about how the oppressed and the oppressor have both been traumatized. And I think it's a very important point, um, instead of this, this attack and counterattack, you know, kind of thing um, that we've gotten into. And, and as a white male, sometimes I've felt <laughs> that that sort of attack, even though I've never been the oppressor, nor have any of my personal ancestors been. Um, and I understand it, but in my circles, I certainly understand um, of indigenous peoples and of, of uh, people of non-European descent uh, and all the traumatization that they inflicted. Um, but then, uh, this, um, what you were saying resonates with what James Baldwin was saying, you know, with race relations, you know, that um, all the horrible, miserable things that African Americans have had to deal with, um, there was a real uh, disturbance of the soul to those that were doing the oppressing as well. So thank you for, for bringing those truths to us. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just say really briefly, um, when I was going through all the visioning about the witch hunts, you know, what I realized was that there were so many men who were desperate to protect the women. Of course they were, they were their sisters, their daughters, their mothers, their grandmothers. 
And they were not able to do it many times. And what I, what I understand, um, I, I say one of the archetypal spiritual roles of the masculine is to be protector and provider. And they were not allowed to enact those, that aspect of themselves in that circumstance. And we know that from our own culture, from, from indigenous way, because when that European <laughs> onslaught came, we, our men were not able to protect what they most dearly wanted to protect. And that kind of is a very specific trauma for, for the men. And it creates many situations. But what I realized was that, that you know, all that had been enacted on the Europeans for hundreds of years you know, they didn't just take it laying down, they fought it. That's why it had to go on for hundreds of years before it subdued their, their way of the circle and their way of upholding the woman's authority and, and their indigenous way. And, um, but what I realized was, was that all those, that they perfected that methodology in Europe and then they put it on the boats, then they sent it our way. <laughs> and who was on those boats? it was the sons and grandsons of the men who were forced to watch the destruction of the women. And, uh, and so, you know, when I really realized that, I, I realized, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not the, it's not the greatest way to be connected, but we are bound in that together, in that, in that story of the trauma. Um, and, and I think our healing is also bound I don't think I've ever said that out loud, but I think that our healing is also bound together. Pat, if we may ask you for a little bit more of your time, there is a question from, is it okay if we ask, take one more I'm, question? I'm here, so you, you. <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah. So you it's from, uh, from Grandmother's Global Healing Movement, Norma. Norma, you are unmuted. Norma Jean. Thank you so much pat your heart is healing us the healing salve you're bringing um i am calling from the deep rainforest of the olympics where i am listening deeply to the duwamish river the ducka bush the ducka bush river and the cedar trees my question is short and to the point I'm a messenger. I've had um, the humble treasure of being with Takshi Blue. Who so bring tears. We had five grandmothers from four continents at Whitby Institute in 2003. So it is her spirit that brings me as an ally, a messenger. And my question of you now, Pat, is how can we gather the grandmothers, the women of this earth more effectively together? And I am gathering a council of women, beginning with Sister Lucy Curian, our living Mother Teresa, Kelly Brown, Rocking Racism, um, yourself, I hope, Vandana Shiva, I visited her two years ago asking, it was a little early, I'm asking you now, how do we do this? So it's really just how to stay in touch with you, to, uh, to be a messenger brokering this goodness of one circle of council of women who know who they are, know what's up, and have the strength to say the truth, do it and be heard. And Creator has put me in a position for more ears to be listening across the globe Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Norma. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Your question. Pat, thank you for your question, Norma. 
How? Well, kind of feels like you're figuring that out already. And uh, I guess right now we're, we're zooming around doing this thing. Um, so that's actually in some ways easy and also not easy. Um, but I think, um, I think what I would say, and yeah, you have my contact info there. So um, what I'm going to say is, you know, uh, so I went through my moon lodging time and then I went through this transition of, of becoming a grandmother. And, and what I was told about it was that I was in labor again. <laughs> it, I was, it was not a, it was not a very graceful, it was not an easy transition for me. It's still not over. It affected everything, it affected my thyroid, it affected my adrenals, it affected, you know, I mean, that's the biological take on it, but it was also doing something, it was rearranging me entirely. Um, and I uh, was told that, you know, I was in labor again, and this time I was gonna birth myself. And this time I was gonna birth myself into the fruit, to becoming the fruitful woman. And so we think of the fruitful woman as being the childbearing age woman, but they say that's only one, that's only one aspect of fruitfulness so if you think that, you know, I got my first moon time when I was 11, and if I had known what to be doing during that time for my whole life, and I finished when I was about 46, so what is that, like 35 years of moon time, of listening to the instruction of the Mother Earth, whoo, boy, by the time I hit this time in my life of birthing myself into the fruitful woman, I'm, I'm a force to be reckoned with. And yeah, my community understands what I'm bringing. So we haven't had that structure. So it really starts with the mentoring of young people, young women, and bringing them up through this time so that we can have that continuation of wisdom. And then they said, if you will see this labor through and not interfere too much, and for me, they told me, just stay with what the plants can give you. They didn't want me to go any further than that with helping these symptoms and everything I was going through. Um, they said, if you can go through it, you will claim a seat in the grandmother's lodge and if you will claim that seed in the grandmother's lodge, they said these, these grandmother circles have to be restored on the earth, that they are the counterbalance to masculine leadership. So I just wanted to um, expand a little bit on, on a little bit of the teaching that I was given as, from the spirits uh, about what this means and why these, these circles are important. Um, so thanks for, thanks for bringing that up for us here. Pat, I just really want to thank you um, again for the humility that you bring forth these powerful teachings to all of us. I want to thank you. Um, it's not I who wants to thank. Thank you for your willingness to come to the end of your resource and share so generously with all of us what came on the other side of that, your willingness to fall onto the door of mystery and share with such ease and grace today what is coming at those crossroads. And personally, I can say thank you for allyship and sisterhood and um, all the medicine that you offer so generously. May you May your peoples receive as generously and richly as you give. And in here, I feel to just speak those in this community to know what is happening to the, the Diné people, the, the Navajo people in this crisis. And if you feel moved, there are ways you can contact me or Pat or others for how you can offer. So thank you. Thank you, dear. Um, I have one sentence I want to add, uh, which is to say that I, I know when I speak about gender, it it's, it's probably sounds quite binary. And I just want to acknowledge that I understand that gender is not a binary, that it's a spectrum. Um, and, you know, like I say, I'm American girl moving back home into something else. So I'm starting from the place that I understand and receiving that teaching. And there's a lot more teaching to, to know than what I have expressed, and I and I just want to make sure that I acknowledge that 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 there there is omission that has not not come through yet for me, and I honor um, that full spectrum. So thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pat. Wow. We have covered a lot of territory. I mean, if we really could just take the rest of the week and unpack these two presentations by Bayo and Pat. And we will be, we will still have more to go. So uh, I want to say a couple of things. One is um, this piece around our healing bond together is bound together. Um, that means a claiming of all of our history and uh, in, in work and then go from there. Because um, sometimes that, that, that what happens in Western culture is that for some groups is that they're a group, the we, and for others they become the individual, right? Like, and so I want us to, to all of us claim our history. And if something has not happened in this time frame or just a little before, that it still has happened. So let's bring it together. Let's bring it to the past and let's heal in the moment. Uh, later on, we're going to be talking, I think Peter Levine is going to be sharing and about how trauma is healed in the moment. It's healed in the moment. And we're healing forward and we're healing backwards. So I really want to invite us to, um, to just claim, claim all of us, claim our history.